As I say, if you go up the stairs yes. here, turn right, his office is to the far end of the um, oh, what is corridor, the room number? and the room number is 103. 103. Thank you very much. Could you take care of those uh, equipment, please? And there's only yeah. one tiny, there's only one tiny um, accent that they use in Brazil that you might not know. You know the C with a little tail on it, okay? And above an A, a little wave. No, not a horizontal, no, an actual curved wave. It's horizontal rather than vertical. Can you, that's above an A. That's right. So, in other words, if we, if we have to make the trailer here for Brazil, which we're going to have to do, we have to get that set correctly um, for national screen to film. Okay. I'll get it up to you sometime today by car. Okay? All right, John, thanks. That's approved. That ad is approved. No, that ad is approved. You go ahead, list the theaters. It, it all looks fine. Precise. Yeah, John is down now. John... Fowler is down now actually checking the theatres to make sure we list the correct theatres. All right? Thanks, John. Take care, mate. Bye. Jim. Oh. Hi. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry that I'm, I'm in the right. middle, right. middle of this uh, nonsense. Let me give you my name card for your convenience. All right. Hold on. Uh, you want convenience? <laughs> okay. Oh, you have a lot of Warner Brothers things. believe I'm going to be with them a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many business cards. Please. Okay. Thank it's you. It's lovely. May I call you Julian? Please call me Julian. Please call me Julian. Well, um, ah, long time to come. I'm I mean, pleased I, to come here. I welcome you. I welcome yeah. you. I'm very, <laughs> well, I'm very pleased. It's, um, well, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting yes, that yes. you've come. Because I was looking today or the other day at some excellent Japanese television commercials. Oh. Excellent commercials. Mm -hmm. Because, first of all, technically they're beautiful to look at. Beautiful to look at. The second thing that I find interesting is the number of, of occasions you use English, both English words, right, right for products, name products, yes. and also show Westerners. Right. I mean, uh, amazing for me for Japan. So uh, I want to show you very quickly yeah. a five second TV spot. Mm -hmm. Now you say, what can you do in five seconds on television? Okay. I want to show you just what Stanley cut, what Kubrick cut for us on a five-second television commercial, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. Very, yeah. very interesting. Very interesting, because what it does, Jim, is this. It, it tends to show you, mm -hmm. when an audience is sitting watching, that one image. Yes. All right? Oh, right here. All right, can you film that? It's very interesting. That one image. Oh. The Shining. Certificate X. Simple. Five seconds, right? And you are reinforcing that message. Right, right. That right. one simple element in the film. It's done so beautifully by so many Japanese commercial directors. I've seen 
uh, so a lot of television commercials for Japan. Right. There's a wonderful one that they do with children and sticking plaster. Mm -hmm. Do you know that, that yes. there's, a, there's a group of Japanese children swimming, some with here, some of them over there, right. and it's tiny children. They jump in a swimming pool and swim. They come up. I don't understand a word of Japanese uh -huh. except oshimashi. Right. That's all I understand. But looking at the television commercial, yes. you know exactly what they're selling because they have a great tradition of using the visual. Films don't need to talk at you. Right. You see them. It's it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful way of, of, uh, of working. Really wonderful. Thank wonderful you. Way. Anyway, anyway uh, we've got some coffee. We're making some coffee. Yes, and um, um, I uh, said that uh, it seems to be impossible. So we try to get him, uh, you know, to look for him. Yes. And coming to the studio. Right. And uh, and uh, I'm going to try to through there with the cameras. Okay. And and then walk into vi where Vivian is, oh. where she is working. That's exactly what I want to. Uh, want to do, you know, so uh, I, wa I want to ask to uh, somebody who are working there and uh, I want to show you something. You read English, obviously. Yes. A try bit. and tell me, try and tell me what language was that? Th uh, that, I mean, how hmm. one... Are we going outside? Yes. Okay. Yes. The, the <laughs> <laughs> These gym are just the offices for the HR. Yeah. For the yeah, other. Um, Steven Spielberg has an office down there. Uh, 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 Jerry. Uh, and the Star Wars people, because you know Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back was made here. Oh, yeah. Let's see, it's there. Their offices here. The stage, the, the, uh, the shooting okay. stages are all set back in the dressing rooms. Oh, so let's let's see if we can find Stanley there. I, I, will, I will check. Oh, this is the old studio for the. Uh, oh yeah, this is the. I mean, um, that movie. Yeah, all all there are five, six, seven, eight stages now, all set aside for film. Um, as I say, we had Spielberg here with the. Uh, Film he was making and the, the, uh, the new Star Wars, the next Star Wars comes back now in May. They come back again. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the people said that, uh, you know, the glass, you know, uh, one <laughs> glass in the door, in the shiny, that glass are uh, two. Real. Look, it was built, Jim. This was the stage where the whole of the Shining set was built. In this stage. In this stage. You can see it's, new, it's a new building. That is because at the end of at the end of we were still one week from finishing shooting. Yes. It caught fire one night and burned down the whole place. Oh. But the whole thing was shot here on that stage. The big hall, the hotel, is a new film. Um, uh, I think it's a. Uh, um, Piers Haggard, an English director, uh -huh. is bringing a new film in here now. But it's a beautiful stage, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stage, and it burnt to the ground. It literally caught fire one night and burnt to the ground. Right after the sh you shot Well, the there film? was still a week to go. Uh -huh. They had to rebuild in small stages, small sections of the film. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But what is interesting is, is that the huge halls... Stanley has, Stanley Kubrick has a theory, yes. and it says like this. Mm -hmm. You don't need cinemascope you don't need the cast of thousands if you have a good set designer mm -hmm. and cameramen camera crew that, that are good right it seems to me that you can shoot straight 166 flat not cinemascope not widescreen just flat 35 millimeter film when you look at the when you look at the shining you'll see that the whole hotel yes. was built inside this one stage oh it's all right everything was built inside this one stage now, when, when you see the film, you will see what I mean. And the exterior yes. was built on the back. Oh. The, the snow, those huge piles of right, snow, right. is salt, industrial salt. So it, you can still do it. It's, yeah, it's trickery and it's fooling. But sometimes I think directors get carried away about location shooting. Right. 
if we have something at the Niagara Falls, of course you must build the Niagara, you can't build the Niagara Falls, you must go there. But if you had taken this film to Colorado in, in, in the snow in winter right. mm -hmm. to try and shoot this film, imagine the problems of taking a unit of 150 people up where there's 15 feet of snow. Right. Right. The first day you walk across the snow, mm -hmm. The footprints mean you cannot shoot there any longer, right? right? I mean, you know the problems. Any filmmaker understands that. Stanley decided to control things. You are able to control things within a studio set, within a set. I see. Well, when did you say this burn? Uh, right after he he took the whole film, so. No, no, no. He still had um, about three weeks' work with Shelley Duvall. Yes. To shoot. Um, when it caught fire in the middle of the night. What was dangerous was that Shelley Duval and Jack Nicholson, their dressing rooms, right. are just above here in a, in a corridor in, uh -huh. in the same building. Yes. It caught fire mysteriously. Nobody knows why, nobody knows how. Hmm. Um, I believe that it was an electrical fault and, you know, the soundproofing in the studio. Because in, and, uh, same is true in, in, in Japan, of course, but in, in most uh, countries now, so good are the microphones, so good are, uh, are, is the sound equipment, that you shoot on you shoot sync dialogue right. sound everywhere you go. Yes, yes. Which means that when you're shooting sync sound in here, there are trucks passing, there are people passing. The, the soundproofing is, is material that can yes. burn. And that's what I think happened, I think. See, but um, let's, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to move up to the right for them. That means everybody can come. You want to go up the stairs? Well, they don't have... Oh, okay. As you wish. And he says, come and shoot. They walked, that with a big fire exit painted on it, uh -huh. and they walked straight through here into the kitchens. Oh! This was the location where they used. It's not like this is, if I turn on the lights, would that be a problem for your people? No. It doesn't matter, because nothing works. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, sir, this hall, えっと、シャイニングのあの、え、台所だったと。これが。なるほど。ちょっと待ってね。変えてもいい。今すぐこれじゃ、これだ。Does he want us to walk up again? Oh, picture, I'm saying, we were talking and saying that this is, right? Yes. This is where they shot yes. the kitchen for the shining here. Shelley Duval, all this was built, the kitchens were built oh, through yes, here. Yes, yes, I remember that scene. Okay. And, uh, um, very she came right through here. Yes. If you look at the film, I'm sure the boys will show you a clip of the film. This is the point at which she ran through into the kitchens. Yes. Well, you can't go through that. It's now locked because it's the storeroom. It's where uh, 
with a current motion. Right, exactly. Right. Okay. Let's see if he's in the current motion. Shall we go in? Japanese television. Martin is one of the editors working on. This is the whole shiny cutting room. It was all cut here, and he's now working on. I don't know French. Hundreds of things. Hundreds uh, of things, but French TV spots. The guys are looking for Stanley. Um, he's traveling. Yeah. Right? He's going to be calling me at some point. Okay. Yes. Okay. So he's going to be calling me here. At some point, you know what I'd like to do, Martin. You, you know the scene. Stanley, Stanley loves dogs. Okay. Cool. Yeah. You want to walk in on your own? Yeah, I will do it. Okay. All right, let me just yell. Vivian? I just don't want her dogs. I don't want her dogs to attack you. Yeah. Is that okay. Okay. Come on. Just one second, Jim. Okay. Hold on one second. Okay. Come on. minutes for the news uh, oh, the news program so I've I'm just that. taking sections because he's because they just want uh, sections from the documentary that don't appear in the documentary I see. yeah I've seen that documentary whole documentary which you have taken you have yes yeah. uh, that is wonderful wonderful you know <laughs> yeah Thank excellent you very much. Well, the thing that I'm just trying yeah. to do now is that it's very difficult to sort of, you know, mm -hmm. choose anything interesting after you've sort of been through it a million times. I mean, in a documentary, the, these are all the shots that appear in the documentary. Yeah. And, you know, when I chose them, it took me about eight months to mm -hmm. choose them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, I've taken them all down now because, I mean, I've been packing most of the things away. But uh, all wow. the footage, all the footage which is... Um, what is the original? 16 millimeter or 35? Yeah, it's just 15. each. I mean, these are the interviews, but yeah. I mean, each 10 minute roll of film. Well, oh, these are I 20 see. minute rolls. I see. They just put in here. <coughs> they were originally all up there, but uh, oh. we've taken them down. <laughs> but I chose, uh, oh, you know, there's uh, Matt as the selections. These were all the uh, shots. You see, look how shiny. Can you focus on this color? Yeah. Oh, these are all the shots that I chose. Now, each yeah. one of these can be either five or, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, 30 mm -hmm. seconds mm -hmm. long, all the times are there. And what I did was that, let's say, um, let's say I decided through the millions of selections which I did, that uh, these were the cards that I wanted to use. Each scene, you know, has a, yeah. a title, right? like Danny convenient. moodying up, right, you know, right. getting ready for the... I see. And then I would go over here. Uh, is there enough light? Yes. Is this the first time you get the your documentary about the Kubrick? Yeah, well, actually, it was the first film I've ever oh, done. Right. <laughs> ah. 
But so, you know, and what I do is that it was very, very interesting. Right? Yeah. Oh, my. Um, well, I what I used to do is that let's say you would uh, try and find an order for right. this thing, right? Right. You get them all up here, uh -huh. and then literally once you've got them all up on the wall, you just sort of. I mean, this was my basic idea that I would just put it sort of randomly together, not necessarily like That's most uh, documentaries on films. Very good idea, terrific. Yeah, because yes. most uh, documentaries on films are like an army of technicians come right. along to Stanley Kubrick and, uh, mm. you know, they see him lighting here and he's uh, directing the actors <laughs> and, you, you know, the audience right. don't get a chance to really sort of make it up right, for themselves. Right, right. That's why my documentary has no uh, commentary oh. either. I mean, you just have to sort of infer from what you see. I see. Yeah, so. I see. But um, that's basically how I did the sort of main selection. I see. And then um, what I used to do is then cut it on mm -hmm. video. Mm -hmm. Most of the machines have been put away now because yes. obviously I finished that stage a long time ago. But it was, I used to cut it on video and then so that you wouldn't mess up the film. Yes. Because, yes. you know, when you've got a lot of footage, you know, and it could be a million ways, right. you know, if you don't sort of try at least a million ways before you actually get to the film, the film ends up being single frames all the right. way through, yes, you know. Right, you're right. It's, it's but at the moment, I'm just doing something that I find personally so boring that it's just out of the mind. Well, uh, we would like to uh, you know, interview you, if you don't mind, in here. No. And <laughs> can we... Um, Set up the whole light here. Yeah, we can. I think I need to. We I need think to we got uh, quartz light lights. I, I have quartz lights. Okay. In fact, if you want to see, I will now show you the Kubrick equipment room. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so you come from right here. And this actually, <clears throat> through here, yes. was actually where we shot the film. This oh, is the, I remember that. This, this is, is the, the story store, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. This is the lighter. Uh -huh. And um, this is where, like I say, this is where Shelley picks up the knife. Oh, yes, yeah, yes. Because we shot most of the film in oh, just yes. what we could get of the studio because, you know, there's very, very difficult to find any space in the studio. Right, I mean, right. the studio is not like, you know, California. Yeah. So we just used every available space. And in fact, this whole room was the kitchen. And now this. It's the larder. Oh. This scene is in this, Inesan. Okay. Uh, oh, this is a oh, actual storage. Well, this, this is all our camera equipment. I see. And this is, a, gosh, this is the camera that I used. Mm -hmm. This here, the Atom. Beautiful camera. Yes. It's really sort of. It's really. I, don't, I, I did start using a different camera. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very, very difficult because. Well, I, I'll show you what I had on it. Um, so that I could do it by myself, Yes. I had uh, my own sound equipment, which is, hang on, I'll show you, which I had strapped to the camera. Mm -hmm. And I had a hyper-directional mic. Yeah. And what you do is that, uh, in fact, Garrett Brown, uh -huh. the guy who invented right, the Steadicam, right. he helped me set this all up oh, because right. originally, I had this thing with bits of string and sellotape, literally, because I couldn't figure out any other way of doing it. And in fact, the most simple solution, which the whole of the steady cam oh. is put together, is Velcro. And oh, just this is a show. <laughs> and it's a good idea. And then this is yes, the mic one. Yes. Oh, I haven't got all the mic things, but they're here. They're here. This is my uh, sound equipment uh, chest, wow. <laughs> kept in great <laughs> order. Yes. And, uh, this really? is, in fact, a music mic. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, hyper-directional, so wherever the camera is pointing, that's the sound that you get. Right, right. And uh, that would fit in there. <coughs> like that. Obviously, I haven't set up everything. I take this off just in case it falls off, because there was uh, another strap. I see. And then it just goes up here like and that. You did it by yourself? Yeah, all the whole thing. All the whole thing. And, I, and I loaded the... Um, the uh, film and the sound and everything. The sound is actually beautiful. I don't know whether you've seen this. I'm sure you have in yeah, Japan, my it. God. <laughs> but um, these oh. took, they take Slowly. about 30 minutes on it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this was developed for the CIA, which mm -hmm. is why it's so uh, good. <laughs> yeah, because it was for high quality, you know, right, uh, right. hidden uh, type of So the importance of this, which is what, the whole reason why I did it myself is that 
you know, I mean, there's, what, four of you guys standing over there all mm -hmm. climbing under tables and mm -hmm. trying to get out of the way. Right. And obviously, if you have one person, it's less inhibiting which is, the, you know, one of the biggest problems because, you know, people are just normal and if a camera's right, pointed at them, right. they start sort of, you know, <laughs> fidgeting and feeling that everything they're doing is, is, is silly. So, but the, really eventually what happened is because I was so young yeah. and because I was Stanley's daughter, people sort of got to the point where they sort of didn't quite believe they'd ever really see it. Right, you know, I mean, right. it's like David Hockney on uh -huh. Bigger Splash, you know. Mm -hmm. He said that the reason why he became so candid is because he never really quite believed he would ever see it. And um, so, you know, getting things like, you know, Shelley and Stanley yeah, fighting yeah. and things like that, there was a point where people just sort of, you know, they sort of ignored me, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, sometimes they would turn around and go, look, go away, you know, because mm -hmm. they knew you were mm -hmm. filming them. Mm -hmm. but, uh, it's oh, essential, yeah. I think, in documentary shooting to do it yourself. And I think certainly this setup worked, you know, I mean, I think the sound is as good as anything, uh, any crew would ever I get. I see. Now I yeah. know that uh, the, uh, the documentary was super excellent, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. So that's, uh, and then all of this is just uh, my father's group. This is the uh, famous 107, 1.7 lens. This is uh, lens. the lenses oh. that we used on Barry Lyndon for the cameras. Yes, yes. These were the ones developed for NASA. See how they are? These were developed by NASA. Mm -hmm. oh God, they weigh a ton. And the reason why they're so big is because they are used um, to for maximum intake of light. They have a point. Seven of uh, uh, f-stop, oh. and um, these, in fact, were developed for space photography, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and <coughs> that's why they're so ridiculously big. Wow! <laughs> so, but, yeah. <laughs> and actually, if you want to, if you come over here. Okay. This. Mm. This. <laughs> is yes. Shelley Duval's wardrobe. Oh, yes. Yeah? It's her dress she wears when right. she goes to Jack and says to him, What are you doing, hun? And he says, Get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. And all the rest of her junk. This is just piled with clothing here. Yeah? Yeah. And this is what I used to carry my camera around in here. If you come around here, this is a child's um, Excellent to carry cameras. Oh. Much better than any grip. Yes. And this is, in fact, my cat's pillow. Uh huh. And then I used to just push everything around in this thing. Oh. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that's how I used to make it. Because otherwise, you know, I mean, all over the studio, you've right. been walking around, right? Right, right. Yeah, you um, see there's just masses of ground to cover. Yeah, but, uh, Anyway, yeah. so I'll leave that for now. Yeah. Um, can I also show something else if you want? Yeah. Okay. Um, in here. Yes. Is all the. In here is <coughs> all the. to Barry Lyndon, yes, you know, right. all these things. There's photographs by the million. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> the original art world. There's, all, there's all sorts of things here, but uh, best of all, yes. sorry, <laughs> you didn't uh, make it down there. Barry Lyndon. Yeah. And, um, and here, this is the fake. Beautiful costume. Beautiful. In very little. They're all just sitting in a pile. This is uh, Marisa's yes. morning gown. Oh, beautiful. That's these okay. were these were all made by uh, Milena and Ulla Britt. Mm -hmm. They all made all these. But you know the things um, that's so sad is that you make all these things for films, and then they end up in you know crappy trunks. Right. You know, I mean, this took somebody a long time to make it. But there's no, I mean, that's like, you know, we made 30 doors for Axe to ja for Jack to axe through. So, you know, everything eventually. But uh, 
there's uh, all the, um, let's say, oh, all the sort of, uh, well, like a clapperboard, mm -hmm. lampshade, and jack, and this, this actually, I don't know, you, have you seen the film? Yes, yes. Yeah. These originally, all these, oh. this is a prime example of when you make things and they never come through. Right, there was right. like months spent on these things to be made for the ballroom sequence, and then Stanley decided yes. that they should all just be plain people and not mm -hmm. sort of have mass all of you. But it's just, you know, masses and masses and masses of things. Here is a, these are 2001. Ah, 2001. Oh. These are all the uh, color plates. Well, what's this? This is, well, you can't possibly see it, but this is one of the plates they use for uh, the back projection yes. for all the ape scenes. Uh -huh. And, uh, oh, well, I mean, there's just millions of them in here. You see it in the back, yeah. Can you see? Yeah. But, I mean, uh, like, these are all the millions of back projection things. Yes. And, uh, yeah, these are all the African landscapes. But you see it in the back. And then, yeah. You see it in the back. And then these are, Video but tapes you see the thing is, is that most of the things, like, oh no, that's just junk, but uh, <laughs> you end up keeping, I mean, look, that was used in the film, that stays in the thing until it becomes out of date. Yes. It's just that everything gets kept. <laughs> and so, in fact, all of this is totally useless, but we keep it anyway, for some reason. Oh, Oop, what should you gonna... Very interesting. <laughs> And believe it or not, this is Barry Lyndon uh, radio spots here. Oh, and so uh, <laughs> this is the way they get kept, you see, <laughs> in great oh. condition. And uh, well, there's, this is all older stuff. This is like Paths of Glory photographs mm -hmm. down there, and um, you know, various junk. But uh, that's basically what ends up. To all the, you know, yeah. other things. But, can I think of this thing if I can think of someone else to show you? Uh, well, I can show you Stanley's office. Yes, how about okay. that? Huh? It's an incredibly boring office. I don't think people will believe how boring it is. This is uh, Stanley's office. Mm -hmm. and, uh, as you can see, yeah. <laughs> pretty disordered. Uh, let's see. I don't think there's anything particular. Yeah. Nothing at all. No. These are um, all his notes for the uh, uh, laboratories. That's, in fact, I think where he is today. Because he's doing all the Spanish and South American prints and dubbing and everything. Mm -hmm. And then he just keeps them in here. Mm -hmm. And then this is the poor man's filing system, which is locked. Uh -huh. <laughs> but he has man, just back, well, you see, I mean, he just has so much paper with uh, uh -huh. junk. Then he has all, obviously, all the things that get written about the film. Mm -hmm. uh, just, yes. I mean, it's quite haphazard. I mean, you don't always sort of end yeah, up finding yes. the things that get printed about the film. But uh, that's article. I think this is uh, Belgium or something. They have the father's uh, good picture. Good picture, Stan? Mm -hmm. Well, that was the one thing that was always lacking on the film. I mean, eventually we chose some, but they're not really... These are from the film, you know. Yes. These are not... Uh, Think. In fact, um, a lot of the stills, because you know, it's very difficult. Because what eventually happens is it comes down to inefficiency. Right. It was sort of forgotten to mm -hmm. take photographs, mm -hmm. and so what was done is that uh, sections of my rushes, which were sort of like close-ups on Stanley yeah. and like that, were blown up onto thirty-five transparencies, mm -hmm. and those were used as the um, uh, promotional photographs of Stanley because, you know, I mean, this is probably the total 
amount of photographs that were taken okay. of Stanley <laughs> on the film. But uh, the stuff that I took of him is like honestly... Like What, these? Sure. Yeah, these. No, I mean, there's not. To, to, um, yeah. to shoot the camera later. Yeah. Well, there's, there's copies. All After, we we After we go back to Japan, we can shoot these. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so. Yeah, these are pretty crappy, these oh, ones. I think they were over there because he didn't choose, he didn't choose yeah. them. Is that like? No, I don't <laughs> think he's uh, got these in the publicity thing. Okay. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. 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 マイクも取ってこなきゃダメだよ。Explain about the uh, the scene. Yes. Well, the scene. And, uh, okay. okay. Shall we yes. show it? Yes. All right. Okay. Well, this actually is not the room in the room, but <laughs> is there any sound? Is this a uh, optical? No. no. Oh, I don't know. All right. Well, really this is just me. Um. Well, <laughs> what? Explain what is happening in the scene. Uh -huh. Well, at the moment, Scatman is just showing uh, Danny and Shelley the inside of the various food cupboards yeah, and yeah, and things like that. It's basically so that by the end of the scene you can somehow have Scatman make contact with Dan. Right, That's right. basically the main but point of this whole thing. This is a place where we, uh, we saw... Well, no. Here, I'll show you. Well, I'll just make it go faster. Uh -huh. um, now this... Yes. Okay, I'll show you. This is the door of where we were actually went in. Right. And um, right, let's get him in there. And there we are. Now, that is where I was showing you the sound yeah. equipment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, this room, these, all of these rooms, the room right. we're standing in, have all been various stages of the mm -hmm. film. I mean, in here, this was the art department. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> this was one of the offices in the art department. And uh, I mean, obviously, you can't swing the camera around, but the whole of this room mm -hmm. was just masses of boxes of photographs of research right. for, you know, the inside of what Lardis looked like and for all the rooms that were used in the film. But this is the bit I was talking about just here. This is where. Scatman makes contact with Danny. Obviously, with no sound, it doesn't make very much sense at all. But anyway, so this is this is where we're. Yeah. And this is where I mean, well, I'll keep it running. Otherwise, you won't see it. But back there, mm -hmm. the very back of the room, is where my cutting room is now. Oh, so all of these rooms have served a sort of a four seasons purpose. They've mm -hmm. all been used for every single thing. I mean, in the film, for the film. <laughs> Everything. Okay. But cut. Okay. Uh, 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 okay. それからね、もう一回ですね。あ、これだこれ。これね、これだこれ。はい、もう。ちょっと待って。いいですか?はい。回ってる?回ってる。はい。このカットがね、あるんですよ。このカット。このカットはさっきのドアなんですよね、あの、あのドアで。これあのフレーム入れたりなんて。
Yes, I said Michelle. Hello? Hi. Sammy? Yes? Ah, oh, ah, oh, been looking for you. Can you talk now? Do you have a moment? Well, now is the time, yes. Now is the time. Hold on a second. Let me pass you on to, to Mr. Yar, the producer, who's standing with me now. Is he ready now? Yes, he's ready. Okay. Just one second. Jim, uh, stand with you. Okay. Uh, hello, Mr. Kubelik. How do you do? Uh, how do you do, sir? My name is Jim Yawoi. How do you do? Uh, can I ask you some questions? Yes, of course. Please. Well, um, why did you choose a horror story to your... Uh, newest uh, movie. Uh, well, first of all, let me apologize for not being able to uh, talk to you in person. I know. I am, uh, you know, a Julian public find you. I'm running around yes. to various laboratories and sound studios. And yes. I'm actually calling it out from the telephone booth. Yes, we understand your situation. Yes. Uh, why did I choose a horror story? Um, well, uh, you could ask me that question about every film I've made, and it would be for me to answer. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, uh, I read uh, a lot and um, obviously always looking for a film story. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a little bit like uh, somebody saying, uh, why, did you, uh, why did you fall in love with your wife? Yeah. I, uh, something happens when you read a story that you like. Uh, it suggests the possibilities of the film. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I thought that this uh, plot yeah. was uh, one of the cleverest of its genre and uh, one of the most interesting. And um, uh, when I read it, I just uh, wanted to make a film of it. I see. What do you think of uh, supernatural power? You it mean, what do I really think of it? Yes. Well, I, I don't know. I think that uh, there have been so many uh, interesting uh, stories and mm -hmm. reports of people who have uh, had occult experiences. Uh, it's a little bit like <coughs> um, when uh, there was a famous astronomer who was talking about um, uh, life in the universe, you yes. know, on other, in other worlds in the universe, and he yes. said, um, sometimes I think um, there is and sometimes I think there isn't. He said, in either case, I find the idea uh, uh, quite uh, staggering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that uh, I would be surprised Do you have uh, the, such kind of ability in supernatural power? Say that again? Do you have uh, the uh, supernatural power ability of uh, supernatural power? No, I wish By I yourself. did. <laughs> you know, people said that uh, you, must, you must have, uh, you know, predicting the, um, the future and uh, reading the minds of uh, actors and uh, getting image from uh, another dimension. I wish I could say that I did have some <laughs> Now, I, I think I just uh, try to do the best that I can and hope that people like it. Yeah. Well, um, do you, what do you think of uh, UFO, which is uh, flying saucers, yeah. people said? Um, do you think, uh, you know, the, the alien people uh, from another planet are visiting our Earth? Well, I've never really made up my mind. Um, again, it belongs to that category of stories that, um, that uh, it's almost impossible to believe, and yet at the same time, some of the sightings are so extraordinary, mm -hmm. and the people who have seen them seem so uh, respectable and beyond, uh, you know, uh, any suspicion that, um, you know, one can only say that uh, uh, I would, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. I would like to believe it. Well, uh, Japanese people love your films, especially uh, travel, uh, super, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, Space Travel 2001. Yeah. And, uh, but people are wondering that uh, what is the meaning of last scene? Um, you know, the old man who uh, you know, lying on the bed in, uh, in, in a very old style ha house. And uh, could you give us well, an answer? I've, I've tried to avoid doing this ever since the picture came out because when you, uh, when you uh, just say uh, the ideas, they yeah. sound uh, foolish, whereas if they're dramatized, uh, one feels it. But I'll try. I mean, the idea was supposed to be that um, he is uh, taken in by uh, uh, godlike entities. Uh, creatures of pure uh, energy and intelligence with no shape or form. Mm -hmm. And um, they uh, put him uh, in what I suppose you could describe as a human zoo mm -hmm. and uh, to study him. And he spends, he, his whole life passes from that point on in that room and he has no sense of time. Mm -hmm. um, it just 
deliberately so inaccurate because, uh, you know, one was suggesting that they had some idea of something that he might think was pretty, but um, weren't quite sure, just as we aren't quite sure what to do in zoos with, with animals yeah. to uh, try to give them what we think is their natural, uh, you know, environment. And um, anyway, when they get finished with them, as happens in so many uh, myths of all cultures in the world, he is transformed into some kind of super being mm -hmm. and sent back to um, Earth, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, transformed and, and made, um, you know, into some sort of superman. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, not, we have to only guess what happens when he goes back. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, a pattern of a great deal of mythology. Mm -hmm. And that was what we were trying to uh, suggest. I see. Uh, could I ask you the same question about the uh, the shining, uh, the last scene of shining? You showed the uh, the picture, and uh, did you have? I mean, I told Julian to ask you. Did you have any difficulty recognizing Jack Nicholson? No, not me. No. No. We 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 could find uh, uh, Jack Nicholson, but uh, you yeah, know that. Sure Right. Well, it was supposed to suggest a kind of um, uh, evil reincarnation mm -hmm. cycle um, mm -hmm. where uh, he is part of the hotel's history, uh, just as in the, in the uh, men's room when he's talking to the former caretaker, mm -hmm. ghost of the former caretaker, who says to him, you know, you are the caretaker, you've always been the caretaker, yeah. I should know I've always been here. Uh, one is merely suggesting some kind of, um, you know, endless cycle of, uh, of, of this evil reincarnation. And um, mm -hmm. also, well, that's it. I mean, Thank again, you. it's the sort of thing that I think is better <laughs> left unexplained. But uh, since you asked me, I'm trying to explain. I see. Okay. Uh, at the end of this interview, uh, could you give uh, to the, uh, the Japanese audience about the, uh, your message to the Japanese audience. What do you mean? Um, anything to the Japanese people, you know. Um, is there any message to them well, from you? Just my best wishes, and uh, uh, I don't really understand your question. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, is there anything to say about the uh, shining? Oh, I see. Well, no, I, I, I never like to say anything about my films because I think that um, that um, the pleasure that an audience receives in, in discovering things for themselves is, uh, is uh, a great deal of what one uh, likes about good films. Um, I, I, don't, I know myself I don't like uh, to read what something is about or to be told. Mm -hmm. Uh, before I see it, you know, or what it means. Mm -hmm. I think the best uh, thing is when an audience looks at a film and, and, and wonders whether something that they see is an accident or whether the director or writer meant them to, to know it. I think that subtlety mm -hmm. and uh, allowing the audience to discover for themselves mm -hmm. what it is, is is the most important thing. That's why I've always tried to avoid <laughs> interviews uh -huh. and, um, right. uh, and and explanations about the films. I think the film, you know, should be able to speak for itself. Yes. Well, I understand, quite understand. Thank you very much, Mr. Kubrick. Well, I mean, is that all you want to talk about? Yes, it was excellent. <laughs> Thank you very again, much. Again, I apologize for not being there. I hope my daughter is, is uh, helping you. Yes, yes. She is a uh, very good help. Well, thank you very much thank again. You. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. like a fad, you know, it was yeah. just my friends and me were playing with a Ouija board, you mm -hmm. know those things? And um, I was just playing around with it, and one of the rules is, is if you get a bad spirit or something like that, uh, it keeps going to no on every single question that you say. Right. And I thought, oh God, you know, so yeah. I was just being silly, and I just, there's this sort of little ritual you do, uh -huh. where you take the glass and you pick it up and you sort of start doing that. Mm -hmm. And I 
was a bit scared. I don't know why. But anyway, and I picked it up, and it literally, and I'm not lying or anything like this. I'm sure this sounds utterly fantastic. But yeah. the glass just went <laughs> like that. Wow. It just sort of exploded. Hmm. And it just went <laughs> like that and just fell on the Ouija board just in a, hundreds of pieces. And I, I was just, even the, the um, base of mm -hmm. the glass had broken. Now, oh, I, I think that a lot of cases, it's the power from you mm -hmm. that makes those mm -hmm. things happen. Mm -hmm. You know, where you start sort of, uh, you know, just the, the fact that one can feel, you know, if somebody did that, you can feel it. You know, you can yes, feel the right. energy coming from it. And probably, right. I should imagine, a lot of that has to do with the fact that one does give out a lot of energy. Right. And you're so hyped up because you're a little scared right. that it just, you know, the collection of energy that's flying it around. It often happens. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know the, uh, the same case, you know, a lot of the same case. Mm -hmm. And uh, what else did you, did you experience? Well, I mean, the thing is, is that when you're a child, you get yourself so hyped up anyway, because you, I mean, I was always very frightened, because my parents used to go um, to parties when we lived in New York, and in New York, you know, the TV goes on till God knows what else, and I was about, I don't know, six or seven years old, mm -hmm. and we had this big house in uh, Long Island, yeah. and I used to just watch horror films all night, so, you know, I'd completely freak myself out, because I was so terrified, but, um, you know, there were times like that where I really, I mean, like, I'm sure a lot of people have always felt that maybe something was holding them or touching them or being near them and things like that when I was a child. But I think that so much of that is because one does scare oneself so terribly when one's a child that you just think all sorts of things. But I've often had, um, in fact, the man who put on my television program in England, um, I'd met him at a dinner party two months before and I just sort of, you know, talked to him, you know, nothing in particular. And it didn't really register. And he said, oh, well, when you finish your documentary, ring me up at home or whatever. And um, I'll, you know, I'll look at it and see what it is. So, fine. And I'm sitting there two months later in my office where, you know, in this, in this house that where Stanley was cutting and everything, not here, somewhere else. And I was, you know, watching uh, my rushes on video. And all of a sudden, I was completely sort of struck by this feeling that, this man, Alan Yentel, was going to ring me and ask me out to dinner, which is utterly fantastic, because I'd met him once, and I hadn't seen him in two months. And it just kept going, and I kept thinking, Christ, what am I thinking this for? And I was trying to concentrate. And all of a sudden, the phone rings, and I suddenly sort of, even stronger, that I felt this. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then I went to pick up the phone, and he said, uh, hello, it's Alan Yentel. And I said, oh, God, uh, Alan Yentel, oh, um, you know, and I said, excuse me, you don't understand, it's just that I knew you were going to phone, you see, and, uh, you know, and I got very hysterical, and I was terribly embarrassed, because I thought, oh, my God, you know, he's going to think I'm a jerk, you know, I pick up the phone and scream. And then he said, um, oh, would you uh, like to go out to dinner? And, and then I just completely thought, this is utterly fantastic. In fact, I can prove it to you, it's in my, uh, if you pass it out, look, I'll show you. Okay. Look, this is my diary, you see. Uh -huh. Oh, and on January, here it is. Oh. See? Almost had a heart attack, was thinking Alan Yenta, I'm going to fan, scream, eek. <laughs> <laughs> see? So, yeah. But that, that, the things like that I find is what happened. But I, I've never, I wish I could, but I've never seen it. Have you experienced it, uh, the, um, guy? Oh, yeah, when it m when moves around, things around, around right. And, you know, well, around. I've never actually experienced that at all. I mean, the, the, the only thing that I, I really believe is that I know that people have seen ghosts. I know that friends of mine have said they've seen ghosts. I've known that they've said they've heard things, that they've felt very strange and everything. But I think that a lot of these experiences are suggestive. You start thinking about it. You start getting frightened. And then because... I mean, the, there's now a lot of um, discussion on, for instance, schizophrenia and manic depression, where in fact it's chemicals in your brain that induce certain characteristics. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that if one's hyped up enough and scared enough, you can produce enough adrenaline and whatever else you may have in your mind to induce you to see things, to be so scared that you actually do see right. things. But in terms of actually very strange things, where like there's writing on the wall and God knows what else, I have no explanation for it, and I don't dismiss it, because it could be true, but then again, it probably isn't true, because there's a lot of weirdos. In fact, on Barry Lyndon, 
I never met so many weirdos in my entire life. In Ireland, mm -hmm. most of the aristocrats that live there, I mean, with all due respect, they're a little sort of crazy. Yeah. And one place we went to where we shot a scene, there's, it was called Huntington Hall. Mm -hmm. And they were all spiritualists there. And they, I had the most bizarre conversations where they say, oh no, we have ghost uh, spirits come here all the time. And we speak to them and talk to them. I mean, obviously people do believe it, but I mean, I, I suppose I would believe it if I really right. saw something, but I haven't, so. Okay, let's start the, uh, mm. the image that we get with us. Uh, let's start the interview. Vivian, uh, how old are you? Well, now I'm 20. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you dear? Uh, do you have any brother and sister? Yes, I have uh, two sisters. Um, they're both yeah, older yeah. than I am. No, both older. Oh, yeah. uh, one's uh, 21, and the other one's 26. And uh, the one that's 21 uh, is going to Royal College of Music, and she's studying opera. Mm -hmm. And um, my other sister, Catherine, she's in fact just down the studio. Mm -hmm. She's working on the Muppets. She does mm -hmm. art direction. Mm -hmm. So that's what she's doing. And you are doing, and you are doing the editing the film. Well, I shot the film and then I edited. Well, I finished the editing, obviously, because you've seen it. But I mean, the things that I've got left now are just sort of tidying up things, like making shorts for P mm -hmm. Paris News, like when you came in. That's are, what you, I are you going to be uh, the movie director? I want to. I mean, I really do want to. I think that, obviously, it's very suspect if children of movie makers want to be movie makers. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's a bit sort of, oh, God. But, uh, I mean, the thing about, if you look at all people who are very successful, like, you know, pop stars, they all end up wanting to make films. Mm -hmm. I mean, George Harrison is producing films. Barbara Streisand, obviously, got into films, and she's now directing one. And. Uh, you know, there's something about films which is in no other art form, in that in order to make a film, you have to go through almost every process that is artistic. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, you say artistic and people start puking. You know, okay, well, it's just a work, but you're trying to do something that ultimately will be considered, you know, artistic. And, you know, there's art direction, there's costume, there's makeup, there's acting, there's writing, there's cinematography, there's, you know, everything you can think of. And, um, you know, because I wouldn't consider myself a, you know, a, a, you, know, a phys, you know, like a physics teacher or a, you know, a astronomer, you know, it, it seems right. the most intelligent thing to do is to get into films. Because, I mean, I've always been interested in photography and I've always uh, spent practically all my life with my father. Mm -hmm. You know, unlike, you know, many people who are in the film business, he is, you know, this sounds, you know, corny, cool. but he is probably one of the few people that I know that really does keep his family life total. You know, it's not flying off here and going there and buy kids, see you in two years. You know, because every, every film that he's ever made has always been near home and it's always been, if we've ever gone anywhere, we've gone with him. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, as a result, I've always been on films. I mean. I went on to 2001 when I was six. I mean, that's basically how I got to be in the thing, because I was just, you know, walking around the studio doing nothing. And, um, you know, I mean, I've, films are fascinating. I mean, that's why people, you know, uh, write millions of books about it, and there's nothing but people talking about films, because it is, you know, incredible. Yeah. The, the, whole, the, the whole concept of movies is incredible. The fact that people turn out to be <coughs> enormous stars, you know, gods and goddesses, even though they shouldn't really be. People build them up so much in their minds that, that they become that. Films are an incredible phenomena. I mean, it's in, I don't think anyone could have believed that it would have turned out the way that it did when they started. Mr. Kubrick. Who you're talking to, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, especially the hum humanity of Mr. Kovic. Um, yeah. How do you see him as a man? Well, I, I think what I said previously, the fact that he has n never deserted anybody. I mean, not that, I mean, that sounds stupid. What I mean is that as a man, I think he, obviously it's very difficult. If you live with somebody, mm -hmm 
all the time. And, you know, other people write about him and they say, oh, he's a genius, you know, he's a god, you know, and they, whatever. You don't really see that, you know. I mean, you can understand, but how could one ever live a real life by walking around going, my father, he's a god. Oh, you know, when I see him, dad, I'll bring you eggs and tea in the morning every single day. You know, it's not like that. You know, he's my dad. I mean, I don't think people realize how incredibly normal it all is. I mean, I was showing you all the... Uh, you know, junk that we've got from films. You know, people think that films are sort of, you know, incredibly uh, mechanized and organized and everything. And I don't think people realize how, how compromising films are. You know, the fact that, oh my God, we forgot to shoot that today. Well, you know, that's it. What um, is his uh, personality? His personality, I think you could probably judge well for yourself on the telephone, <laughs> that he, he's very uncomfortable mm -hmm. in a situation where he has to talk about you know, uh, his films. I mean, I don't blame him. <laughs> I mean, it's very difficult because you don't, I mean, one never wants to appear to be foolish. And, um, you know, so, but certainly I think that, excuse my dogs, they're right. just all, all right. freaking out back there. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't really, the thing, ab the problem about asking a question like that is that whatever I say will sound sort of silly. But basically, in terms of his character, he's incredibly hard working. I don't think, and you know, he works constantly. You know, maybe that's not good for him, but he feels that that's necessary. He would feel worse on holiday sitting there doing nothing than if he was actually, you know, reading or, you know, playing chess or whatever he, you know, finds that entertains him. But certainly, I think out of all the people that I've ever met in the film business, mm -hmm. he certainly is the most I mean, I've said hard working, but he's certainly the most careful as well. You know, I mean, people say, you know, he spends so much time making films. Well, then look at all the films that take a year to make, and they're crap. So you know. how, how many, uh, you know, the holidays does he have in a, in a year or in a month? Well, he doesn't have any holidays. I don't think I've, I haven't been on a holiday in my entire life either. I mean, holidays are really, I mean, I think if you analyze it, people go on holidays because they hate work. And they go, oh, God, another two weeks right, and I'll be right. on holiday. Oh, heaven, you know. And if you enjoy what you're doing, it's sort of, it's worse if you go right. on holiday because then you're not doing what you'd like to be doing. Obviously, one doesn't sit there, you know, 8.30 in the morning, jump up, go to your desk, work till 11. I mean, it's not like that. Right. But, you know, it's just a calm, normal, consistent progression of work. Mm -hmm. Well, um, how is he uh, as a father? Well, I, I said, I mean, he's terrific. I don't think, you know, I keep having to qualify these things I'm saying because, you know, they would be considered highly suspect if I sit here going, oh, my dad, you know. But I, I do feel that for him. I feel tremendous respect. I feel very grateful at the fact that unlike many parents, they actually, you know, have a lot of faith in their children. I mean, my father has always tried to make all of us and help all of us in whatever we wanted to do. My sister wanted to be an opera singer, so, you know, all our lives we've had piano lessons, we've had music lessons. Anya used to do operas with Jonathan Miller, the youth. Uh, do you know Jonathan Miller? Um, she used to do children's operas in the Roundhouse in London, you know, and, uh, you know, he's always tried. I mean, for instance, the, when I started this film, I, I didn't like school. I always found school a very different environment to really exist. Mm -hmm. You know, it was something that I was never comfortable in. So consequently, I left school itself when I was 15. And um, then I had to get some examinations. So I then went to college, and I left college when I was 16. Spent the summer wondering what on earth I was going to do. Started, um, I had a lot of friends who were mus musicians. That's also, you see, my mother's parents were all opera singers. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, it's a very musical uh, side of the family. So, of course, that's always been an arm. My mother was a, a ballet dancer and the sort of German equivalent to Doris Day in the 50s. I mean, she used to, in Germany, she was the sort of little starlet. And, uh, in fact, that's how my father saw her. He saw her on TV and just sort of completely fell over himself because you know, he thought she was so beautiful. <laughs> and then she, um, quite coincidentally, she came for the audition of the part for Paths of Glory and of course, you know, he took his chance. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, going back to him, he also, uh, 
you know, when I started this film, uh, he said, okay, well, work in the art department, that's fun. Mm -hmm. And I was working in the art department when I was 16. On this film, and, uh, you know, I was making models and doing research and making tea and, you know, and I thought, oh, God, I can't bear this any longer. You know, I'd, I'd like to do what I was doing when I was in school, which was singing and writing songs and being in a band. Now, that probably sounds a bit silly, but anyway. And so he said to me the night I was going to break the news to him that I wasn't going to be in the art department anymore, he said, um, Viv, uh, your mother and I, uh, we feel that it's about time you made a film because I'd always been very interested in films, and I had made many films, you know, in school by myself and things like that. And of course, I wasn't going to miss this chance. So I, I said, I'd absolutely, you know, God, I'd be totally crazed if I thought, I, okay, so. And then I just started, and I literally just walked in and just started shooting, just started filming. Um, uh, Dougie, all the crew that work on my father's film have worked on it since the beginning of time. I can't remember when they came on, but all the major people, the focus pullers, the continuity lady, everybody, they all end up being the same people every film. And uh, so they all helped me, you know, get the equipment, learn about it. And then it really was, he just said to me, the only way you're ever going to learn how to do this is to just do it. And you do it whatever way you think you you know, are able to do it. And he would look at my rushes with me and he'd say, well, you know, you shouldn't pan so quickly, you know, you're not keeping the focus right. And, you know, that's really all that I did. And for a year I was filming everybody. And I think it was then that I was 17, right? And uh, then I finished it when I was 18. And then it took me about a year to go through the material. Because the other thing is I transferred all the sound. Obviously, it was on eighth of an inch SN tape, and I transferred it all onto this. Mm -hmm. And I had to do it myself, because obviously people said things that you wouldn't ever want anyone to hear, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so I transferred the whole thing myself, which took me about two months, because it's like, you know, I mean, just it's millions of feet. And then it was all transferred onto video. And I watched it on video for about six months, just going through it, making millions of notes. I mean, these aren't actually the books, but they're somewhere back there. <coughs> and it takes a long time because, you know, you find things interesting, and then you look at it and you go, I wonder if anyone else would find it interesting, whether they'd find it funny. Mm -hmm. And um, it's also very difficult because you're trying to at least give character, you know, portray everybody that's important, Stanley, Jack, and Shelley, and Danny without doing it in a way that appears to be, you know, all these films that they make about films have this very uh, synthetic feel about it. They're mm -hmm. all sort of cutty and, you know, um, you know, like I was saying, you know, an army of technicians comes in and uh, here's Mr. Kubrick, Mr. Kubrick, hi. You know, and, and they're all very sort of, you know, synthetic. It's not real. And so the thing that I hope that this documentary would do is that it does show the reality. It shows that Shelley was jealous of Jack and that Jack did piss around a lot and that Danny is very funny and that my father works hard and that all these things and to try and represent it in half an hour. I mean, so. Yes, that's the point where I noticed in, the, in your uh, film. Yeah. yeah. That's very, very nice. It's very good. Uh,
カラーバー 1KC ただいま収録中、えー、10月24日ホテル、えー、インバーネスコートホテル4階です。